Hello and welcome today to today's event, Skiing the Social Media Slopes, How the Utah Transit Authority Masters the Data Moguls. This is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow for government technology, and if you feel like catching me later on the Neil Cavuto Show on Fox News, I'll be on there at 4.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time talking about cybersecurity. But for right now, I'm very excited to serve as the moderator for today's event and just wanted to say thank you for joining us. I know we're going to be in for a really great session over the next 60 minutes. Now, before we begin, a couple brief uh, housekeeping notes. A recording of this presentation will be emailed to all registrants within 48 hours. You can use this recording for your reference, and feel free to pass it along to your colleagues. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and you can participate in the Q&A with us by asking questions at any time during the presentation. You should see a Q&A box at the bottom left of your presentation panel, so please send in your questions as they come up throughout the presentations. We'd love to answer as many as we can, and we'll try and get to as many as we can at the end of the webinar today during our Q&A session. Now, if you'd like to download a PDF of the slides, you can do so by clicking on the Webinar Resources widget at the bottom of the console. Also, during today's webinar, you'll be able to connect with your peers via LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. Folks, it is about social media, so let's use social media to share the information. Please use hashtag GTLive to connect with your peers across the government technology platform. So now at this time, we also recommend that you disable your pop-up blockers, and if you're experiencing any media player issues or have any other problems, make sure to visit our webcast help guide by clicking on the help button at the bottom of the console. So today what I'd like to do is have everybody joining me in welcoming Lindsay Lenio, Senior Social Media Specialist for the Utah Transit Authority, and Anil Chawla, the founder and CEO for Archive Social. So what we'd like to do is here's what we're going to cover today, folks. We're going to cover skiing the social media slopes. This is how the Utah Transit Authority, the UTA, got ahead of all of this digital avalanche that's coming. But before we do that, just a quick note for the Center for Digital Government and Government Technology. We've got a lot of national thought leadership pieces. We're award-winning publications. We cover a lot of things related to information technology, including running the business of modern state and local governments. So make sure you come on over. These resources are no charge to our state and local uh, customers out there. And if you have any questions, make don't hesitate at all to give us a call. We'd love to answer your questions. So let's talk a little bit today about what this is about, folks. And what this is really about, it's about ones and zeros. And so this is actually my name in ones and zeros. Look, social media, uh, unlike politics, it's, it's about, or, or I mean the ones and zeros, unlike politics, it's ones and zeros. It's not R's and D's. It's not social media. It's not opinion. It's just straightforward what's happening out there. But the minute we start applying people to it, we get social media, we start talking about things that become a little bit more subjective. So that's part of what we want to cover today. So what I want to do is, first of all, let me introduce you and welcome you to Utah. A couple of interesting things I found out about Utah as I was doing my research. Number one, obviously, it's called the Beehive State. Now, for you uh, conspiracy theorists out there and science fiction fans, to me, this looks suspiciously like the spaceship from the day the Earth stood still. Who agrees with me? I think that's what it is, but again, as we found out, even with the remake uh, with Keanu Reeves, maybe not somebody's favorite movie. We'll tell you about that later. Now, the state bird is the California Gulf. Folks, that is one angry bird, so we decided for the purposes of today to replace it with the Twitter bird, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later. So let's get into what we're going to cover today. Just three things I want to talk to you about before we turn it over to our very exciting speakers. First of all, let's talk about the social media recon. We're going to give you kind of an overview of what's going on out there. Let's talk about bits, bites, and barristers. Yes, that means legal issues, how you can get sued for saying something or deleting something on Facebook, and then can the beast be tamed? So first thing, let's talk about the social media recon. What do we have out there? First of all, if you've done this for any length of time, it's like herding cats, right? Very famous commercial there. You get the cowboys out there. They're herding cats. Now, to some folks, this is going to feel more like Mission Impossible. Why is that? Because... Just in my little humble opinion here, I think part of it is because you've got an explosion of devices, an explosion of the network. For example, iPhone uh, last quarter sold 75 million phones leading up through Christmas. 75 million folks. That means more people out on the Internet and on their mobile devices, a lot more mobile engagement over mobile devices now. And the fact is they're requesting and looking for more and more engagement with their government through these mobile devices. So that's how mo social media is starting to become relevant because if you know whether it's the iPhone or the Android, social media is built into this, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. All of the different channels you're going to be on is built into what uh, these phones and these devices are providing. But what's one of the second things? Well, look, I spent 18 years in state and local law enforcement, great state of Kansas out there. Um, 
so I, I get uh, uh, when we didn't have any mountains, but I get the uh, the nice, uh, beautiful scenery out there. However, though, you know, the one thing that is in common is that anytime you deal with something like this, there will be the harbingers of things to come, and part of it is um, the use of social media, as we saw. Here's it for example. It seems pretty clear cut, according to this New York Times story. Even if it enrages your boss, social net speed is protected, unless, of course, you happen to be a reporter that at the Arizona Daily Star who tweeted out said, hey, what, no overnight homicide? You're slacking, Tucson. You stay homicidal, Tucson. Probably not the best thing when they got fired. They said, eh, sorry, it was offensive enough and uh, not about working conditions, so therefore it wasn't protected speech, so the reporter got fired. Now, here's a kind of a fun one, but it does show that there's some impact. If you're going to be in politics, if you're going to be the mayor of a town, you would think you'd have to have thick skin. Well, a man with a fake Twitter account sued the Peoria, Illinois mayor over a real police raid over his use of a fake Twitter account where he was doing parody of the mayor. So there are some very real consequences to these things. But here's the one that, as I said, where was a harbinger, how deleting a Facebook post may violate free speech and lead to a lawsuit. Well, it was written by a lawyer back on August 31st of 2012. And fast forward, what did we have happen? A sheriff removes a Facebook page after lawsuit over deleted comments. They got rid of their entire Facebook page because they deleted a comment. And, of course, what did somebody do? They sued because of that. So uh, one of the things we hope you get out of this today is it's not just about the technology. It's about the policy. It's about the governance. It's about your use of the social media. So last thing, can you actually tame this beast? Well, of course, this is the Internet. What would be a, an Internet-related uh, webinar without LolCat or something like that? Well, look. Grumpy Cat says, no, you can't tame the beast. Well, we disagree, and one of the reasons we disagree is because we've got two expert speakers that are going to tell you how you can tame the beast. And in the interest of national security and protecting your Twitter and YouTube accounts, by the way, one of my previous appearances, I dealt a lot with the CENTCOM hack of YouTube and Twitter. Folks, password security is extremely important, so this is our random password hack of the day. Can you guess what the password was for Forrest Gump? Yes, you're correct. It was one Forrest one. So that is our random uh, password hack of the day, and now for our show. So before we get into this, uh, and before I introduce Lindsay, let's take a look at our first poll question, because I think this is going to be very instructive for our speakers and, and as we address these issues. So let's take a look at this first one. What is your opinion on social media as a public record? It's definitely a public record by law. It might be a record, but our activity is not worth retaining. I feel strongly that it is not a public record. Or I don't know. So pick one of those four, and as they say, let's go to this scorecard and see what it says. Well, the scorecard says two-thirds of you say it's definitely a public record. Now a third of you, not sure if it is. Well, that's a good lead-up to our next speaker. So before she gets started, let me introduce Lindsay. Lindsay Wardle-Lenio has worked at the Utah Transit Authority social, as, as the UT, UTA social media specialist for two years. Now, before joining UTA's public relations team, she worked in marketing, communications, and print journalism. Lindsay graduated from Utah State University and lives right there in Salt Lake City with her husband, Matt, daughter, Kate, and their English bulldog, Daisy. Now, when she's not working, she enjoys skiing, obviously, naturally. You're in uh, Utah. Lindsay, so I would expect you to do that, and obviously traveling. So why don't we do this? Lindsay, you've seen the results of the poll. Now let's turn the floor over to you, and let's have that discussion about social media. Okay, sounds great. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here talking about how the Utah Transit Authority um, uses social media and sharing a few best practices that we've seen. Um, I am from Salt Lake City. I've lived here my whole life, and it's an exciting time to be in Salt Lake. Um, our city is growing like crazy, uh, but we have some challenges. You know, we have um, a lot of urban sprawl. We have uh, terrible air quality during the winter, and that's kind of what drew me to UTA. You know, public transportation is a great way for cities to grow sub sustainably, and especially in Salt Lake, where I said, like I said, um, you know, we had such bad air quality and um, our traffic congestion is getting just terrible, and so a lot of people are looking to public transportation as a way to help solve these problems. So the Utah Transit Authority is located along the Wasatch Front, which is kind of the main mountain range in Utah. Um, it stretches from Ogden, encompasses the Salt Lake Valley, and goes all the way down to Provo, for those of you that are familiar with the area. And we, we offer um, several different modes of transportation. We have light rail, we have 
commuter rail, which you can see in the photo there. Uh, we even have a streetcar, the first modern streetcar in Utah. We were able to bring back the streetcar in 2013. Uh, we offer buses, ski buses, paratransit buses, even some express buses that make fewer stops. And we have uh, over 122,000 boardings every single weekday. We serve more than 80% of the state's population. We stretch across seven counties and 1,400 square miles. So we really serve a wide audience. And this is wonderful, but it's also challenging. Um, we have a lot of different needs. We have people who want a bus stop right on their front door. We have people who want 24-7 service. They would love it if we operated every single day of the year, all night long, all day long. And then we also have people that want really limited service. They would like us to lower our fares and you know, only offer the bare bones. So uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be at UTA, but it is also a challenging time to try to meet the needs of this very diverse audience. So at UTA, we use social media for two main reasons. The first is to tell our story. Uh, we're doing so many exciting things at UTA. Like I talked about, we're providing all those different kinds of modes of public transportation. We just finished a major rail project um, three years ahead of schedule and millions of dollars under budget. We're working to improve air quality. We're helping develop these great walkable neighborhoods in Salt Lake that we really haven't seen before. But we realized that while we had all these positive things happening, our story wasn't always getting out to the media in the way that we hoped. And so we used UTA as a way to connect directly with our writers and with the public without relying on reporters to you know, see our press release lying on the fax machine and maybe type up a story that shares our point of view and maybe not. And then the second way that we use social media is to share critical information in a timely fashion. If you are late for work and waiting for your train and it's snowing and 30 degrees outside, the last thing that you want to do is have to call UTA's customer service number, wait on the phone, hope that somebody picks up to find out where the heck your train is. So we actually use social media to um, send out alerts anytime a train is running more than 10 minutes late, if we have, ever have a service interruption, anything like that. We try to get that information to our writers as quickly as possible so that they can make the choices that they need to to get to their destinations. So to delve in a little bit more deeply um, on what we're doing on social media, we have a Facebook page where we post events, uh, promotions, contests, messages, and we also answer questions. And we get a lot of questions, pretty much. Any question you can think of, we've seen on Facebook, including, um, you know, can I bring my dog? Can I bring my bird on the, the the bus or the train? And the answer is no, unless that happens to be a service bird, and then welcome aboard. And we also have a Twitter account. That's our, our second main social media channel that we use. And that's where we tweet out these service updates and notifications and delays that I mentioned earlier. And then we also answer questions. And our Twitter feed is staffed uh, five days a week from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, you know, we get anywhere between 50 and 100 to 150 or 200 questions every single day, just depending on how busy it is. And then we also try to answer questions on holidays, weekends, evenings, um, just making sure that, you know, every single person that has a concern or needs to know where their bus is gets an answer as quickly as possible. And it might seem like this is a customer service function, but it's actually a critical piece of our public relations strategy as well. When people feel like they're being heard, even if the answer isn't ideal, even if the answer is, gosh, you know, our trains are running a little bit late, or shoot, looks like you're going to have to wait for the not, that next bus, it makes them feel better. It makes them feel like they're being listening to, listened to and somebody out there cares and that even if the, the answer isn't ideal, at least their concerns are being heard. At least, at least they're connecting with somebody. And so we've seen a lot of success with that. And we've even been able to turn some people who are very critical of our organization into advocates for UTA just by connecting with them and letting them know that their concerns are valid and that somebody out there is listening to them. Um, we also have a blog that is located on our website, and this allows us to share longer, more complicated messages. 
one of our main concerns, and I touched on this earlier, is you know why why don't we offer service seven days a week, 24 hours a day? A lot of people say, you know, gosh, I, I want to get home after last call, or I want to go to this super late night event. And the answer is a little hard to fit in 140 characters on a tweet. Um, you know, it, it comes down to budget. It comes down to the fact that we did a really extensive pilot program several years ago uh, that just um, wasn't successful. You know, people said that they they wanted late night service, but there weren't enough people coming out for that to really make the program viable. And so we use our blog to share longer messages, and then we actually link back to that on Facebook and Twitter. And it's a great way of sharing complicated messages with the public that you know you're just not going to be able to fit on Facebook or Twitter, or you try to fit them on Facebook and Twitter, and you know they completely lose their impact because it's just too much information in the wrong context. So this social media strategy of listening to people and trying to respond to them promptly even when the answer isn't ideal um, really was put to the test last month. Um, on March 3rd, we were gearing up to celebrate our 45th anniversary, and it was going to be a really exciting day. We had a message from our president that we were going to share. We had all these amazing vintage photos of, of UTA you know, back in the 70s, and bus drivers all dressed up in their bell bottoms and sideburns, when we had several incidents um, that caused major delays. And as you can see, it was a snowy day. People were out in bad weather, and nobody was happy. And the main, the, the, the most critical incident um, actually delayed people by up to 45 minutes to an hour and a half um, on their way home. We had to take people off the trains, put them on a bus, drive them all over to a connecting train. Um, and so it was just you know, a, really, uh, a really difficult situation and one that inconvenienced a lot of people as they were trying to get home in this storm. So we put our social media plan into action. We um, started sending out tracks alerts, uh, letting people know, you know, here's where the bus bridge, that bus transportation system that I mentioned, is taking place. The, these are the kind of delays that you can expect. And at the same time that we were sending out that information, we were also trying to answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. People were wondering, you know, how, what is the most convenient way for me personally to get home? I'm standing at this station downtown, and can you please tell me when I can expect to see the next train? Or, you know, is it going to be faster for me at this point to wait for the train, or should I drive? And we were just getting question after question. So we tried to answer all of those on an individual basis as much as we possibly could. And uh, this went on from about 1.30 in the afternoon until about 6.37 at night. And um, you know, we were, we were a little nervous about the response that we were going to see, but when we sat down and recapped the event and tallied up the responses that we had seen on Twitter, we realized that while the majority of tweets were neutral, just people wondering, you know, hey, where's my train, or can you help me with this? We actually saw just as many positive tweets as we did negative, and that really told us that we were doing something right. You know, people were out there in the cold, in the snow, and sure, you're going to get a few complaints, but we also had quite a few people who said, thanks for the information, you guys have my support, you know, thanks for keeping us in the loop. And so that told us that, um, you know, we're doing something right uh, as far as our social media strategy goes when it comes to communicating with people and getting back to them in a timely fashion and letting them know that they're being heard even when the answer isn't necessarily the perfect answer. So just to um, share a few best practices with you guys, you know, I think that I've, I've touched on this over and over, but we've really seen that transparency is key. Um, there are some agencies out there, and in fact there was a study done, it was published in, on Wired.com um, a few months ago, about public transportation agencies that just spit out information. It's a one-way conversation and there's no back and forth. And they're actually ranked a lot lower when you look at their overall Twitter sentiment, you know, the tone of the conversation, than agencies that have this back and forth even when you know, maybe their service isn't running as smoothly as others. So um, transparency is key, you know, be honest with people. Uh, we, we've learned better than to try to sugarcoat things. You know, if we don't have um, 
an answer right at that minute, we will look it up and try to get back to them. But we'll tell them, you know, we, we don't know the answer to that. Give us a few minutes. Let us see what we can find out. And then uh, the other best practice that I think that we've learned is that building these relationships can turn your social media followers into advocates for your um, organization. You know, we try to get to know people. Um, like I said, we follow up with them. If we don't know the answer to something, we will contact our planning team, we'll contact our um, executive team, and sometimes we can even put these people in touch with our planners directly. You know, we'll have them message uh, their, their phone number to us and, and have them chat with our planners so that we make sure that every single person that we're communicating with is getting their questions answered and being heard and, um, you know, just feeling like somebody out there cares about them. And um, Archive Social has really helped us a lot in the few months that we've been using it. Uh, Utah law changed last summer. By July 31st, we had to have a program in place that allowed us to record all of the conversations that we were doing on um, Facebook, on Twitter, so that they could be searched by the media. It was part of the um, grandma laws that are that are in the state. Um, and so we had to get something in place pretty quickly that would allow us to record all the back and forth that we're doing on social media and archive it somehow in a searchable way. Um, and then the second way that Archive Social has really helped us is that it helps us quantify issues. We have a Wi-Fi service on our commuter rail, and um, it's kind of hit or miss. It's something that we're working on. Sometimes it works great, and sometimes it doesn't work so well, and we're um, hoping to invest some more money into improving it. And the manager of that service came to me last fall and said, hey, can you pull some tweets? I want to get a feel for what people are saying about Wi-Fi, how big of a problem it is, and I was able to to um, look that up in Archive Social, export some documents, and give him a really comprehensive look about um, what people are saying about our Wi-Fi system, who said it, what days those, those tweets and those Facebook messages were coming in. And it wasn't a huge project for me. It was something I was able to pull together from my house um, in a matter of minutes. And if I didn't have Archive Social, I would have been scrolling back through Twitter for days. I, I can't even imagine how I would get that information. And then the last point is that um, it enables us to track these critical conversations that we're having on social media, which really are the key to building relationships. Um, and there was an instance the other day where somebody contacted us on Twitter, and I thought, gosh, I have talked to this person before, and I can't remember if we got back to them, what the answer was. Um, you know, it was months and months ago, uh, but I was able to look that up on Archive Social, see what other conversations we'd had with that person, and follow up with them. Um, so it's really been a very useful tool for us, and you know, I think that going forward, it'll help us. It, it gives us the peace of mind to know that we're complying with these critical laws, but it's also going to help us quantify what we're doing on social media, and um, that's an incredibly valuable tool. So I think that that pretty much wraps it up to me. For me, uh, Morgan, if you have anything else you'd like to add, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. No, thank you very much, Lindsay. Great job. In fact, I, we've already got some questions coming in, so folks, keep your questions coming in. We'll get to technical questions. We'll answer right away, but some of the great ones that we're going to hold on to and discuss in our Q&A at the end. So now let's hop in and talk about our next presenter, so Anil Chawla. So I'm going to read you a little bit about his bio, then we're going to go to a question here. Um, but obviously it's always great when you can have the founder and CEO of the company on to answer your calls and take your questions. Uh, actually, I guess take your questions. We're not taking calls at this point. You're on the call. So make sure you send us in your questions. Uh, so let's go to this poll question here real quick, and then I'll give you a bit, little bit of Anil's background. So let's talk about how your agency is currently retaining records of social media. Number one, we're not retaining our own records and re rely on the networks. That means you rely on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, whatever, to manage your conversations. We take manual capture, screenshots. You do copy and paste, things like that. We use a personal backup tool like Backupify, SocialSafe. You use an automated solution for archiving. And then, of course, the best answer is you are already a happy archive 
social customer. So while you're responding to that, let me give you just a little bit of Anil's background here. So Anil is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. They are a civic tech company that specializes in archiving social media for public records requirements. Now, Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina in 2010 to launch the world's first open interactive archive of social media. Since then, Archive Social has enabled hundreds of government entities such as the city of Austin, state of North Carolina, and folks, the big one, the U.S. National Archives. Remember, they archive everything. Folks, this is big, the U.S. National Archives, to ensure long-term transparency for government social media communications. Now, the company was selected for the prestigious, not prestigious, but because it's very important we have to say prestigious, Code for America Accelerator in 2013, and uh, I have a lot of good friends at Gartner, and I know some of them probably voted for them, becoming the 2014 Cool Vendor in Government by the leading analyst firm, Gartner. So let's take a look now at the results of the poll question and see what we had. So, wow, two-thirds of you say it is a public record, but now about two-thirds of you say you're not retaining your own records and rely on the networks. This will be good information that Anil's about to give you. Uh, about 30% of you say we take manual screen capture, so you folks are into the very labor-intensive uh, part of that, or you use an automated solution for archiving. So, wow, Anil, that sounds like they've really teed up this next part of the discussion for you, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Morgan, for the introduction there. And thank you to all of you who have taken time out of uh, your busy Tuesday to tune in. Uh, and finally, I have to say thanks to Lindsay for uh, sharing your story with us. Uh, I, I, what I found really compelling about Lindsay's story is, is that um, higher, higher, the, the bigger idea there behind um, customer service day-to-day -day as a government agency on social media ultimately having impact um, that's, more, that's far-reaching in terms of being able to transform perhaps your critics and the advocates uh, over time, is uh, one of the most powerful benefits we've seen from social media. So I really appreciated learning more about that from Lindsay. Now, in terms of what I hope to cover today, uh, it really is uh, content that's geared towards the two poll questions that we laid out. Uh, the first poll question I thought was striking where two-thirds of you thought that social media is a record, but the other third uh, came back and said, I don't know. And so that's where we're going to start with, with my portion of the webinar today, is really talk about social media as a record, look at uh, the Utah Grandma uh, Act, and, and talk about what the law says. But then we want to dive deeper than that and take a look at real-life examples, some real case studies, understand what's actually happening out there in the industry, both from a day-to-day -day standpoint as well as from a legal standpoint around social media as a record. And then touching on the second poll question in terms of about 60% of you uh, currently relying on Twitter and Facebook, uh, we're going to look at different solutions here for, for you. And my goal with this presentation is by the time we're done, you're armed with four or five different possible solutions for your agency to put the record keeping in place that is required by, by Utah's laws. Uh, time permitting, I do want to share a quick demonstration with you of a real archive, and, and Lindsay's been gracious to allow, allow me to present uh, the right UTA archive so you can see how this is actually done and how uh, they've been able to capture this immense amount of conversation that's happening day to day. And then, of course, we're here to answer your questions, so please do use that Q&A window. Now, to jump right into it, we will address the public records question. Again, for that third of you, here's really the requirement that lays out that social media is a record, just like, just like many of the other records that you maintain today. Uh, and it's verbiage from your legal code that uh, it's been in place for quite a long time, but it was written in a very forward-thinking fashion. And the key phrase here is, regardless of physical form, when describing a record. Um, what that means is that uh, when this was written, it was written in a time when we weren't quite aware of what the technology was going to be in, in terms of how we communicated, but what we really care about is the content of the communication. So to give you a, a clear example, if you were to receive a crime tip, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you receive that crime tip on a piece of paper, in an email, or in a Twitter direct message. A crime tip is a crime tip, uh, and it's that content that really makes it an important record. Also, just look, thinking about uh, the day-to-day -day for the, the Transit Authority, the types of questions and, and the citizen service that's happening there, uh, it doesn't really matter that that's happening over Twitter, Facebook, email, or in some other written form. Uh, those are all records worth keeping, and that's exactly why those records are being kept. This is the fundamental verbiage in the law that, that really makes social media a record and, and, and creates this important requirement for transparency. Uh, same verbiage that's applied to email and, of course, everything else you retain. But uh, Utah has gone a step further. This is uh, at least preliminary guidance from Utah State Archives in 2011. I believe we've got some members from the archives team uh, here with us today. So uh, I'd be really interested in understanding if there's more updated guidance from Utah State Archives. But we, we ran across this online. 
this is guidance from 2011 that spells out some really key points, uh, including that content on social media sites, sites that relate to government business uh, must be managed as records, uh, that it's important to uh, manage um, social media sites, um, the content that's coming from social media sites in a similar manner that you manage email. And then one of the key points here is that there doesn't have to be a new retention schedule for social media because, again, it's not the physical format. It's really just the content that defines how you retain it. So, you, you, you know, if at all possible, you could schedule your social media uh, into the same existing schedule that you already have to determine how long those records need to be maintained. And I've got the link here to the, the 2011 guidelines that we can share with you after this presentation. So that's what sets the baseline from a legal standpoint. Again, Utah State Archives is not the only records management authority in, in the United States that's interpreted social media as a record. This is something that we're seeing consistently in state after state, all the way from the federal level down to each individual state to, to specific jurisdictions. So there seems to be a very strong consensus across the country on this issue, um, even though the laws haven't had to change in any way because of the way they're written. Now, what does that mean in terms of the actual social media that's occurring on, on your Facebook pages, your Twitter accounts, your YouTube sites, Instagram, and so forth? Well, here's some key examples of what um, may be creating records for you to retain. Uh, one of the most obvious examples in the area of public safety and emergency response. Uh, and what I've highlighted here are some, some pretty high-profile incidents from across the country that I think we're all familiar with. Uh, you know, weather events like hurricanes, airport shootings, and then one of the, 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 the best examples of social media and emergency response was during the Boston Marathon bombings. So really, uh, obviously a, a horrible tragedy, but the silver lining was in terms of how the Boston PD was able to react and protect the public, and, and from a social media standpoint, how they were able to leverage platforms like Twitter to really get the information out and protect the citizens. Uh, and a trivia fact out of this is, the tweet that I have here on the screen of, of the suspect being captured, this is the very first announcement of that suspect being captured. It was put out as a tweet. It wasn't a tip to a journalist. It wasn't uh, a, you know, a press release on the website. It was simply a tweet because that's exactly how Boston PD was using that Twitter account, was to get the information out as efficiently as possible so that it could virally spread across social networks. And so there's really obvious examples there with, with Boston Marathon bombings in terms of records of, of high value. Now, hopefully your, your jurisdiction will never encounter a crisis of that scale, but we obviously have emergencies um, all the time uh, and natural disasters and crimes. And the more you're able to use social media to get the information out, squash rumors, inform the public, the better. But those are, those are some clear incidents in which you're going to create records that must be maintained. And then day-to-day, -day, uh, Lindsay touched on this. Customer service. Uh, I, I fundamentally believe that, you know, my view of describing government is that it exists to serve the citizens. Uh, and so whatever your agency does, um, when it's on social media, the key reason to be there is to have that two-way dialogue with your citizens and provide that service. And so we have, a, we have an example here that we pulled from Texas DOT uh, that, that I've been using in a lot of presentations. I think Lindsay also had some great ones out of her presentation. But in, in this case, I thought this was an interesting example because it's not, not obvious at first that you would think about this as an important dialogue. But essentially, this woman was trying to reach the Texas DOT uh, over the phone. She couldn't get through. And so she started tweeting at them, and they told her that the phone lines might be busy. And ultimately, she determined that the phone number that was on a mail, mailing was actually incorrect. And she was able to inform the DOT that, hey, this phone number that you, you sent out was wrong. Could you fix it? Uh, and they thanked her for, for informing them. And so this was an interaction where a citizen was having trouble reaching them and actually provided information for the agency to correct what had, a mistake that it had made. Nothing at all to do with traffic, right? It's not the mainline business of this agency, but it's the customer service that's possible with this two-way dialogue in social media. Uh, and hopefully there's no legal context around this, but certainly an interesting conversation worth, worth holding on to. So I encourage all of you, as you're using social media, to think about how you're using these platforms, how you want to be able to use them, whether it's public safety, emergency response, and of course that customer service. And, and then how, how are you going to deal with uh, you know, the issue of records? Are you going to be creating records? I think the answer is uh, almost always yes. Uh, and, so, and if so, um, what are you going to do to, to get ahead of that issue and be proactive to ensure that you have the records that you're required to maintain by, by grandma? And the reason why I encourage you to do that is that 
the expectations are changing. Um, like Lindsay said, uh, they had a requirement to get the record keeping in place so that journalists could access the information. Well, here's a really obvious example of, of a citizen wanting this information. This actually comes from the Seattle PD from April of last year, about a year ago, where a citizen noticed that some of the Twitter feeds for, from the Seattle PD were delayed in terms of reporting some of the police incidents that they were supposed to report on an automatic basis. And he tweeted to say, um, you know, I've noticed things are missing or delayed. And ultimately he said, I want the archives of all of these all of these Twitter feeds, and please consider this a public records request. So this is really a sign of the, of the changing expectations, a sign of the times in terms of a citizen making a public records request for social media using social media. Now, Seattle PD directed the citizen to fill out the proper web form uh, uh, in order to make this request, but they did come back and say, yes, we're going to respond to this. Just give us three weeks to process this request. And what your agency has to think about is if and when this happens, how do you avoid uh, you know, the overhead of having to compile all this information, possibly taking several weeks? How do you turn three weeks into maybe three minutes? Now, that was a very you know, specific example showing how social media can be requested. The reality is that most agencies today are still not receiving requests that are directed particularly at you know, Twitter or Facebook content. But you may recognize some of the, the verbiage here that I have on the screen. These, this is the kind of language that our customers are seeing when it comes to public records requests. Any and all documents that relate to, all notifications of the street closure, all emails and communications. This kind of language uh, is very common. And if you really think about it, many cases, your social media content will fall under these requests. So whether you've realized it yet or not, you may have already had requests that uh, could have potentially included and required, required you to include your social media content in fulfilling that request. And so that's something that our customers are able to do now, uh, having the awareness that these types of requests are fairly broad in terms of the nature of con the type of physical content that could be provided. So I hope that paints a clearer picture of how your social media can be creating records that are worth keeping. Uh, now it's important to just share with you some of the legal landscape and, and what, what are some of the lessons learned um, by agencies out there and lessons that you can avoid uh, by being proactive. Uh, and again, leveraging the four or five different solutions that I'm going to lay out for you later in this webinar. Now the first legal case study I want to cover actually comes from email because we have a lot to learn from email. There's, uh, a perfect analogy between the way we have to retain email and, and the way we need to retain social media. Um, and we really went through this whole question about email about 20 years ago in terms of whether or not email is a public record, and, and I think we all agree that it is today. This case deals with uh, a more specific issue around metadata. And the reason I, I mention this is to help you think about the different kinds of record keeping options that are available. In this case, the city had uh, received a request for, to produce an email uh, that they did not have the original email for, they just had a copy of the email. And uh, what happened is well, they actually forwarded the original email. And so they had the forward, but not the, not the original. And so they were able to respond with that forwarded copy. And the person requesting realized they were getting a forward copy and not the original. It came back and said, we want the original, and we want the original metadata. Now, if you're not familiar with metadata, this is the technical information that's embedded in the email about how it was sent, who sent it, what computer servers it went across, what are the timestamps. And so the citizen really wanted to see how this email was sent and who sent it and, and when it came through. The city couldn't produce it. Ultimately, the Supreme Court in Washington ruled that, yes, metadata is part of the public record. They fined the city $100,000. And the city eventually settled the case for more than half a million dollars because they had to pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees. So the key takeaway from the story is that having some record is a good idea, but the quality of that record really matters. And so... Having some record versus a complete record costs the city half a million dollars, and it's something that's really important to think about. Because I know about a third of you mentioned that you're screenshotting today. Well, when it comes to social media and taking screenshots, uh, if you think about your Twitter feed, a tweet has at most 140 characters. But underneath that tweet, uh, you may not realize this, is more than 2,000 characters of metadata. So thinking about that for just a moment, Taking the screenshots, you will get the 140 characters, but not that metadata. And we've already seen case law around metadata being really important in states like Washington and Arizona. And so it's very realistic to see that happening in, in other states like Utah. And then a case study that's a little bit closer to home with social media. This actually deals with um, a, a legal situation and not necessarily a public records request. In this case, uh, the city of Honolulu, uh, the PD actually was receiving some content from an advocacy group 
that they didn't feel was relevant, so they decided to moderate the page and remove the content. Now, they removed the content uh, thinking that they were cleaning up the site, but the group actually came back and filed a lawsuit claiming their First Amendment rights. Now, this case actually was never ruled upon, but the city did have to settle the case by paying attorney's fees. And the key takeaway here was that uh, you know, you have to be careful about your moderation policies, have a clear policy in place, be able to demonstrate how you enforce that policy. Uh, here at Archive Social, we believe in your right to moderate. But the key takeaway here was that when you, when you go to court for something that you deleted, it's really hard to tell your side of the story if you don't have records of, of what you moderated away. So we hope that Honolulu had the records. I believe they, they, might, they had some form of records. But something for your agency to think about is that if you are moderating content, you want to have the records to show what you've done and be able to tell your side of the story. All right, now so transitioning, I've got three uh, more stories here just to share from our customer uh, from our customer base that are a bit close to home for us because when we started, we were helping agencies be really proactive, and now we're seeing how those those agencies have been able to um, have been prepared and been able to save their their, their cities and counties uh, potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars by having some kind of record solution in place. In this first case study, we're dealing with a city in South Florida. The police department actually was essentially trying to do their job, right? This is what the police department uh, was, was, was effectively doing by trying to protect the citizens. But they ended up sharing a scam alert for a company um, based on a tip from a law firm. And it turned out that when they put the scam alert out, the, the company didn't quite agree with that label. So they came back, the company came back and said, okay, we're not a scam. Can you take this down? The city took down these postings. Uh, and then the company came back and sued the city for, for defamation. Fortunately, the city was archiving, uh, and in that lawsuit, uh, the company actually said, we want all the social media postings that, that called us a scam, and we uh, even want the postings that you've already removed. And so fortunately, the city had been archiving, was able to produce that. And you can imagine that if they weren't able to produce those records, that they'd be in, in a worse legal situation going into this case. The second customer case study I have is from across the country in California. Uh, this is, again, another police department doing their job. Uh, in this case, not even going out of their way. It, this is just uh, implementing a city program in which they were helping get information out about the city's gun buyback program. And uh, our sales team had actually been working with this customer periodically to say, see if they were interested and eventually told, uh, convinced them to start a free trial of our product. And three weeks into the free trial, uh, this police department received a public information request from the NRA regarding the gun buyback program because, of course, the NRA wants to ensure this program is being run in accordance with law. Uh, and so fortunately, they were prepared to respond to that request. Uh, and, of course, they've continued to uh, ar continue archiving with us moving forward. And the final story, Spokane, Washington, this is actually a government technology case study that you can download. I think we'll send it out after this webinar. Uh, study of Spokane, Washington, uh, basically wanted to be proactive, got the archiving in place, and they were simply promoting a city event, like almost every agency does, promoting just events that are happening in the community. Uh, unfortunately, somebody died on that, that local event, and uh, the lawsuit for, for the, from the family requested that the city provide all the social media in relation to the promotion of that event. So they were able to pr produce that content again in, in accordance with that discovery request. So these are just three stories that we've seen from our customer base. Of course, there, there are countless others. So this hopefully creates some urgency uh, and some motivation for you to think about record keeping if you're not already having uh, those records put in place. So let's talk about some solutions if you need some. Now the first, uh, I hate to break it to the 60% of you that are relying on Facebook and Twitter, but that, that unfortunately will not be a reliable strategy for you in terms of meeting the grammar requirements and ultimately protecting your agency. At the end of the day, the social networks have made zero guarantee that they will, they will hold your data and make those records available. And the moment that something's deleted from Facebook and Twitter, it is gone forever. Uh, and you may think that you, your agency and your employees may never delete something from your sites, but the two-way conversation is just as much a public record. And so if a citizen were to send you a crime tip over a private message or a question or a complaint or some kind of citizen feedback on Facebook and then delete that, then an important record would be lost. And so you really, you really cannot rely on the social networks. Uh, you may be able to get to some portion of that information today, but it's not a long-term strategy. So let's talk about some of those uh, better strategies that you can put in place. 
And I'm going to work from the most basic to the most sophisticated. So starting with manual archiving, this is just taking screenshots. I know, again, a third of you are doing this. I'm sure you know uh, it's easy to take a screenshot, but those of you who are doing this know that it's very time-consuming. It's hard to be comprehensive. And so I, I would, if you're not doing anything at all, I would highly encourage you to take screenshots, especially if you're moderating something, to take a screenshot first. But keep in mind, this is probably not a scalable long-term strategy. It takes a lot of your time and effort, uh, up to 20 to 30 hours a month is what we've heard from customers that do this. Uh, it's very difficult to organize and manage screenshots and even more difficult to search them to, for, for if you need content. Uh, and then ultimately, again, these screenshots will not have that metadata we discussed. Uh, and it's easy for anyone to dispute a screenshot to say that it was Photoshopped. So if you think about how this might hold up, if at all, in a legal context. Second solution is a better solution, which, is, which allows you to automate this process. And there's a number of, of cheap, you know, consumer-oriented backup tools that have been on the market for a while that help consumers back up their own social media. And because a, a lot of technology was not available for a while, government agencies have, in some cases, adopted these backup tools. Now, these tools are great because they are very inexpensive and they are automated, but it's important to know they are backup tools. They are not archiving tools for records management. There's a key difference there. And the difference is in the nature of the capture. Uh, the capture is not as comprehensive, but more so in the nature of producing records. These backup tools don't provide very much in terms of search capabilities to be able to get to the records to make sense of them so that you can actually be ready to respond when needed. So there could be a lot of time and effort uh, and cost on the back end using these kinds of tools. And uh, some of the tools that you can look at are Backupify, which is, I believe is about 100 bucks a month now. It used to be a lot, lot cheaper, but they've raised the price. Still very inexpensive. And uh, SocialSafe, which I believe is something like $20 a year is worth looking at, that is a tool that will store the social media content on your own hard drive. So then you, you do need to figure out a way to preserve that content. Uh, again, these are not archiving tools for records management. And for $20 a year, you're only going to get so much as a government agency in terms of your protection. But if you have limited budget, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to check those out. Much, much better is to put a real archiving solution in place. And there are a number of vendors out there, including us. Um, a lot of vendors do come from a history of email archiving and web page archiving. And so I wanted to talk about this class of vendors as an all-in-one solution because uh, there is an appeal there in terms of being able to archive different types of content in one place. Uh, so that's a good idea from a procurement standpoint. It, it makes things a little bit simpler to work with one vendor. Uh, but I do want to just raise some things for you to think about so that as you evaluate these different vendors, you can separate them out. Uh, the key point here is that all-in-one um, is sometimes sounds better than it really is. And, and the, key, the best analogy I have of that is the, is the spork. If you remember the combination spoon-fork, uh, may not be the best way to eat a salad, right? Uh, but what you should keep in mind in terms of archiving is that Typically, an all-in-one all archiving vendor has some key focus, whether that's email archiving or web page archiving, that they do really well. So you have to figure out how they're fitting social media into that. Are they chopping up the social media content into email? And if so, how are you going to put it all back together? Are they converting it? Are you going to lose the metadata? If they're a web page archiving company, are they even getting the metadata in the first place? So there's a lot to think about uh, in terms of what the social media capture really looks like. Ultimately, you want to have that metadata you want to be protected, and you want to be able to put it all back together um, as easily as possible. Uh, and so it's worth weighing those risks. Now, these solutions do cost anywhere from a few thousand dollars to several thousand dollars a year. There may be fees around setup uh, and exporting of your data. So it's important to understand what all those different costs are, and there's a lot of vendors out there to look at. Ultimately, I'll boil it down to these four factors. No matter what solution you look at, I highly encourage you to require these four uh, pillars of, of any archiving solution to, uh, to ensure that your agency is protected. One is you want to get the information as quickly as possible to ensure there's no data loss because this is data that's out there on Twitter and Facebook. It's not in your control until you get it. You do want to be comprehensive as possible, especially because all of this information is being broadcast in public. So um, even if you don't have the record, it's likely that someone else could. So it's better for you to have more than less, and you do want to have that metadata. Authenticity is pretty interesting because ultimately you're doing this for a legal reason. So if, if you were called to court, how do you prove that your records you've kept are, are actually uh, authentic records and can serve as legal evidence? And then finally, context. I really think this is the most overlooked uh, aspect of, of any archiving solution uh, in our industry, which is it's not about storing data. It's about being able to use it and make sense of it. So how can you piece together that Facebook conversation from three years ago that had 100 comments on it? How can you replay that Twitter timeline? Making sure your solution makes that painless because that's really where your time and effort will be wasted if, if you pick a solution that's missing the context piece.
Um, and that's essentially what we're focused on here at Archive Social in terms of being a social media archiving company. I know we're running down to just running down the wire here with just a few minutes left. Uh, I do want to share a very, very quick demonstration to you. Uh, and since I'm going to keep it brief, I want to mention that we do have some open archives out there as well that you can explore your own where our customers have taken transparency to the fullest and they've made their open records fully open. Uh, and here's just three examples. Again, this is available in the slide deck. And here's my contact info. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a quick screen share to see if I can pull off a two-minute demo here. Uh, just so you have an idea of what UTA's archive looks like, what it means to automate, uh, and you're armed with all the information you could possibly have. So I'm now sharing my screen. I actually went straight to the search dialog. I, I know Lindsay had an example of, of, of a situation in early March where it was really critical to use social media to get uh, guidance out to the public. And so there's a lot of search options here uh, in the archive they have around date range and being able to search different content types. You can even piece together advanced searches with you know, who was involved, which citizen sent the content, who received it, so on and so forth. But I'm just actually going to search to that date range that Lindsay mentioned uh, in, in early March. Um, and basically what's happening with UTA is their content, their social media content is being captured continuously throughout the day. So that's that frequency piece, making sure that content is being captured dozens of times a day to minimize data loss. Um, being as comprehensive as possible, getting both sides of the conversation. And you can say as I bring this up, there's an interface here that allows uh, Lindsay and her team to be able to review what's happened in that time frame. Um, as she mentioned, it's a powerful communications tool outside of the legal requirements. But being able to uh, really replay that conversation across these date ranges, having high resolution photos, having videos, having uh, all the information you could possibly need in a stream, and then being able to filter down. So being able to drill down to say, okay, well, I, what I'm interested in are seeing what, what comments we received on the photos that we shared on Facebook. And perhaps what I'm looking for um, is, is in here somewhere. I think I found a, a comment uh, here from Shannon that I think is, in, is, is what I'm looking for. And being able to recreate that context. So context is incredibly important. So being able to turn that comment back into the full thread that it belongs to, expanding out the conversation. And then from a legal standpoint, having the authenticity behind the record. So this I know is kind of falling off your screen a little bit. I'm going to drag it back, right back in. Being able to see the metadata. I already showed you the metadata on a tweet. Um, I'm going to show you the metadata on a Facebook post here in a second because I just loaded it up. We don't just have that, those, those four or five sentences of text. We have all this technical information here secured with a digital timestamp so that it can be used as electronic legal evidence in court. So tying all those four factors together is what, what this archive is all about. Uh, and again, I encourage you to look at one of the open archives if you're interested in seeing more. And with that, uh, again, I think I have my contact information on the screen. I'm going to uh, send this right back to uh, Morgan, and we'll take your questions. Oh, hey, fantastic job, Anil. And for you folks there, uh, there's Anil's contact information. And again, just uh, make sure you reach out to us, and we'll make sure we get you everybody's information. So hey, real quick, look, we've got a little time. So, And actually, we've had a couple questions come in on the Q&A. So actually, Lindsay, first one for you, and this one comes from uh, Amy Christensen. And what she asks is, do you find it hard to involve your employees in branding efforts as social media brand ambassadors? Um, you know, we uh, it's it's definitely a challenge to keep everybody on the same page as far as branding efforts go. Um, some of the the things that we do is that we have a um, set number of people who are allowed to um, use the UG social media challenges or channels to communicate with the public, and we make sure that our messages are very clear that we send with share with them. We send them a calendar um, every week on Monday of all of the social media events that we anticipate. And then anytime we have a message that we're going to be sharing with the public, um, we make sure that we communicate with the team in person, by phone, by email. We have uh, responses that we pre-write out and email to um, our team so that when they get on Twitter, they know, you know what response to use, um, what to say, and then as the situation changes, you know, maybe um, the event uh, evolves or new information becomes available, we make sure that we share that with the team so that everybody's on the same page um, on a continuous basis and that you know, the branding of UTA remains very consistent. No, excellent answer. And just a quick follow-up to that is to do what you do, how many employees do you have staffed to do this? So um, I, 
I uh, manage UT social media full time, and then we have two other people who sit in our Rail Control Center and um, staff Twitter from 5 a.m. in the morning till 8 p.m. at night, Monday through Friday. And this allows us to really get immediate information out to our writers um, anytime that we have a delay or an incident that's going to um, cause some service interruptions. They hear they hear about it right from the Rail Controllers. They see it happening on the screen, and they're able to turn around and get that message out to the writers um, really quickly without having to go through any other channels or try to get the information you know, from someplace that's not the direct source. Sure. Hey, Daniel, this one's for you because we always get this question each and every time. People love what they see. Some people are thinking this has to cost just a ton of money. Can you address the cost issue for Archive Social? Oh, absolutely. I know I talked about the cost of other solutions. And so because we sell transparency, we're very transparent about this as well. It's on our website at archivesocial.com pricing. Uh, but effectively, we've priced this so that it is uh, uh, as much as possible a no-brainer for agencies that can find some budget. Uh, we've made it so that 90% of, of entities in the United States can fall under our standard pricing, which is under 5000 annual, making a discretionary spend. No other fees. We don't charge for setup or exporting the data or anything like that. It's really a fixed cost. And the way we do it is based on the level of social media activity you have. So if you're generating you know, 3,000 you know, records and comments a month, then you'll fall under our standard plan. If you, need, if you generate a lot more than that, then you will have to go into one of our higher plans. And then we do have lower plans that are less than 5,000 annual, a bit less than 5,000 annual. So we do that you know, in relation to how much activity you're seeing because we think that's where you get the most value is uh, based on how much is happening, not necessarily just how many Facebook pages you have. Uh, but you can check all of that out on our website. No, outstanding. And um, one of the other questions, too, kind of a quick follow-up, uh, Anil, for you, is that you mentioned something like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we had a couple questions in here about some of the different data migration. How many different platforms right now does Archive Social cover? We currently cover Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So those five platforms, and we are looking to significantly expand our platform coverage this year. Okay, outstanding. So, um, uh, Lindsay, this one's for you from Linda Trujillo. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what types of migration plans are in place for the data you are archiving? Oh gosh, you know, I might need a little bit more information about what she means um, in regards to migration plans. Can you clarify? Well, let's see if she'll reply back to us. And while she's doing that, uh, let's. Uh, uh, so, if you would, Linda, just submit us another question with a little bit more detail. In the meantime, Anil, let's go back to you for a second, because um, we always get questions too about. Speaking of archiving, though, but uh, if somebody launches their Facebook page, for example, more than three years ago, how do they handle that older data if they start archiving now? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, essentially, this data is is hopefully still out there on Facebook and Twitter. Again, we talked about how you don't want to rely on the networks, but to some extent, the data uh, is 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 partially available, if not most of it's available, until it may be removed or Facebook no longer makes it accessible if they ever do that. So what we try to do is when someone signs up with us, we actually try to pull all the historical content, going back as far as we can to bring in everything we can into the archives so that you're not starting from scratch. and. Uh, we're pretty successful with doing that today, and that's not actually something that we charge for. It's just a way that we help our customers get started. And uh, Morgan, I also want to just touch on Linda's question. I know we're, we're trying to get some more clarity on, on exactly what what her um, what, what were her questions around migration. But in terms of migration of data, one thing I want to make clear is that uh, each of the social networks is non-standardized with their data formats. Facebook has its own version of what a photo looks like versus what Twitter has in terms of the data. So um, from our official standpoint, what we want to do is, is make all that data completely available to you. And so in our product, you're able to export out the raw metadata directly that, that we receive from Facebook and Twitter at any time. You have full control of, of your entire archive such that if you wanted to get a zip file of everything that's ever been captured, you can do that with two clicks. Oh. Perfect. No, great answer. And we'll have a follow-up real quick to Linda's question. Hey, but Lindsay, a, a little bit more of this is for you as well in terms of when, uh, you know, kind of interesting because you guys talk about when you have major incidents. When do you generally see your your readership or your comments spike or your followers increase? Is, there, is it usually around a major incident, or do you guys have plans in place to proactively increase the number of people you're reaching out to and connecting so that they're always staying in touch as opposed to just when uh, an incident happens? You know, um, our, we don't really have a plan in place. It, it all happens pretty organically. Um, we do see a uh, 
definite spike after we have an incident. We also see um, a spike in followers after we have promotions. You know, we try to uh, temper some of the more critical service-related information that we're putting out with fun things, positive news. And so, um, you know, we see a lot of people following us after we had like a big giveaway or we had um, a past promotion last year encouraging people to take public transit and help improve air quality. So that really helps us um, get more followers too. Um, so far we've really been focused on the message that we're sending, not how many followers we have. Um, our emphasis is just on uh, you know, being responsive and being transparent and responding to people the best we can. And, you know, we feel like if we take care of that end, uh, the followers will continue to grow and will we'll take care of themselves. Sure. We've got about one minute left, so I want to sneak in two quick questions. Fifteen seconds for you real quick. I feel like uh, Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. So real quick for you, uh, you said that UDOT also has a blog. How is that being archived? And then, Anil, last question for you, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, um, UTA also has a blog. Um, it is uh, at um, on our website, on our homepage at, at rideuta.com. Um, you know, and uh, we don't have an archiving program necessarily in place for that. Uh, we just have all of our um, blog archives on the website. Um, you know, we never delete anything, and um, we have uh, our comments that we get on the blog, um, and that those are those are public as well after we approve them. But we don't have an archiving plan in place for that right now outside of that, but I think that moving forward we'd love to incorporate that somehow so that um, our blog comments are just as searchable as these Twitter comments or Facebook posts. Sure. And Anil, real quick, last one for you. It came back from Melinda. So um, what, are, what plans are in place to migrate data out of your, and she says, I assume, cloud-based servers into other servers when data becomes obsolete or new versions of Twitter, Facebook are in place? I mean, is that more of a retention schedule um, with you guys being cloud-based? Is, is migrating to a server an issue? Right. Yeah, I appreciate the clarification there, Linda. And uh, Part of that is what I was talking about earlier in terms of just being able to export your data anytime. Um, it's fully available to you. We don't charge for exports, and you have access to every piece of information, whether that's the way it looks, uh, the raw metadata, the images, the video files, all that is completely exportable out of our system at any time. Uh, and so in terms of being able to migrate the data or simply just have control of it, you have full control. And then in terms of data becoming obsolete and, and new versions of, of Twitter and Facebook messages, that's that's really our value add, uh, is that uh, your IT department, I think one, would, would would have to make a huge investment in trying to capture this information in the first place out of all of these different networks and dealing with the different data formats, but then also having to manage the changes that are happening. So that's really what we're doing. We're not at all about just storing data. It's really the, the technical challenge of getting the data in a frequent fashion, dealing with the data format, standardizing it so that's searchable, but then also dealing with all the changes that are happening. That's actually the value that we provide. Oh, hey, great. And look, I, there's plenty of questions, guys, that unfortunately we can't get to them all, but make sure you download this. So since we're at to the end of it, I uh, want to be respectful of our one-hour commitment, so let's wrap it up here. So first of all, in closing, I want to thank Anil Chawla and Archive Social for being the sponsor of our webinar today, and also a big thank you as well to Lindsay Lenio for, I mean, her great presentation, great answers to this. And again, we want to bring you these, we want to continue bringing these discussions to you, so make sure you share this with your friends. Again, replay will be available 48 hours from now. So hey, everybody. Thank you again for joining us for this time. We look forward to seeing you again on another government technology event. And if you guys are going to go out on the slopes of uh, Utah, make sure you send lots of tweets and pictures to UTA so we can follow you guys. So everybody, have a great afternoon and thank you for attending.